Natural Spaces Domes is owned and operated by Dennis Johnson and Tessa Hill. Located in North Branch, Minnesota, we have a complex of an office dome, three model dome homes, a screen porch dome, two workshop domes, and a furnished prototype of a mini dome are option for small living spaces. We invite you to visit our complex for an in-person dome tour wearing a mask during this difficult time. Natural Spaces domes are easy to build, healthy living spaces, and they're fantastically energy efficient while providing you the best housing value around. We started Dome Talk as a way to engage with the dome community, create a forum for all your dome questions, whether they are Natural Spaces domes or not, and to provide a space for dome enthusiasts to connect with one another. So that's why we encourage you to connect in that chat area. Now I'd like to introduce our hosts, Dennis Johnson and Derek Miller. Dennis is the dome guru and has decades of experience designing and fabricating domes. He knows what works and what doesn't and has designed over a thousand domes worldwide. His patented dome connector system is the best available and he will help you at every step of your dome dream as a contractor, builder, designer, and dome owner. So you're gonna definitely wanna to talk to Dennis. Our project manager, Derek Miller, joined the NSD team a few years ago, bringing with him a lifetime of construction experience and he handles a wide variety of responsibilities for us. From collaborating with Dennis on project management and client contracts to working with in the shops to refine building techniques, he is familiar with the dome process from the ground up. He is also our video guy, filming and designing the educational vi videos for virtual classes and tours. So Derek and Dennis, do you wanna say hi really quick before I jump into our first question of the night? Sure, say hi. Hi everybody. This is uh, Tessa. My wife. Hi there. Hi. Happy to see you. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, our first question is from uh, Robert in Hollywood, South Carolina. I did see Robert on the line tonight. Robert, welcome. I really like the looks of Mr. Johnson's fireplace. Please might Mr. Johnson give us details on the fireplace and how it distributes its heat throughout the home. Basically the working fundamentals of how the fireplace heats up the space, how difficult of a build was it, how well it performs. And after using it all these years, is there anything you would have done differently? Just anything in general that comes to mind as a possible inconvenience optimization or what you really love about that. And before you get started, I have its follow-up question from last time from Donna says, which of the four floor plans have fireplaces? So I'm gonna stop sharing here and go ahead and take it away. Want me to take it away first? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you, got the, you got the prop there. So I'll let you take over on this one. All right. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Dennis. And uh, this is Bear Creek Dome. That's what you're in here and I'll move the, the uh, computer around so we get different views at different times during the evening here. This is a uh, fireplace. It's a Napoleon fireplace. That's the brand name. Um, it's part of the design that we wanted. It had to be big enough to fit this area here. I'll just quickly show you a little bit of view upstairs. There's a continuation of the uh, artificial stone, uh, concrete stone. The hearth that you see down below is taconite from northern Minnesota, from a mine up in, Tacon in the Aurora area in northern Minnesota. The fireplace is a sealed combustion unit. There's gasketing around the doors so that when you close the doors, you don't get any air from the inside going into the fireplace. That was part of what we needed to do to have this house certified. It's an energy five-star rating, which is the highest rating you could get. We have a HERS score. This is done in 2015, so it's 15 years ago. We have a HERS score of 55, which at that time was really good. Still is good, I shouldn't say it that way. Um, this distributes heat through to the master bedroom, which is over here, and to an upstairs bedroom. And those are the two rooms that we have heat coming out. But at the top of the fireplace, right along here, are vents. And so we turn the fan on 
and that blows hot air out of that fireplace chamber. There's a chamber in there. It's not just the fireplace. There's an actual heat chamber like that, about five feet high. But what makes this work is two six inch diameter outside ducts. They come in along the top edge over here from the outside. But reality is that you want to open that fireplace up. Yeah, this is a very, very tight house. Um, it needs outside air. If we didn't have those outside air, we couldn't have a fire in here because there's no, there isn't that much air coming in to keep that fire going efficiently. I, I'm not sure. I haven't, can't try because the house is sealed up and, and what you're dealing with is the fireplace is the fireplace. But we have a, a nice view of this. Um, I'm just going to walk over here, but I'll show you the size of this. We didn't clean it. Oh, we didn't clean the fireplace. <laughs> so it's, it's a uh, quite a wide fireplace. I believe it's a 42-inch size fireplace. So this fits the scale of what you're in. This is a 49 foot diameter dome. Well, that's all part of it. Do we use it to heat the house? Not really. This is radiant floor heated. It's on right now. It's been on since October. It's a social fireplace for us. However, in the beginning of the season and near the end of it, when we turn the uh, radiant floor off or on and it's not working, the fireplace does provide the heat. We've done it say, gee, why don't we start a fire tonight? You know, warm the house up on the inside. Doesn't take much. This could heat us in here without radiant floor. It could heat the entire dome. We have a, a ceiling fan up on top, which can blow air down. That's what you need to have. Can any of our domes have a fireplace? Yes. The question was, which domes allow fireplaces, everyone. It doesn't matter what the plan is, you can put a fireplace in. We want you to put the fireplace more towards the center instead of the outside wall, because on the outside wall, your chimney would be extremely tall. And it's a hassle, a hard one to clean the flue. It's a real wood burning fireplace. That's the difference. So was that enough of an answer? <laughs> yeah, I think that covers it. I think that covers it. Okay, Carrie. All right. Well, moving on to number two, and I don't think Cassandra is with us tonight. She was with us on our last one. And so this is a mm -hmm. continuation of her question from... Uh, Carrie, you know what? If she's not on, let's uh, save that one because that's a pretty in-depth okay. question. And... Uh, We'll see if we can get her next time, if that works, if you want to go to Adam. Definitely. And if Cassandra, if you are here, uh, just send me a message in the chat and we'll make sure we get you in the rotation. All right, Adam. Adam has a two questions. Is it possible to harvest water from a dome roof? And second question is, rather than a riser wall to add height, can the dome continue past the apex equator line? It would taper in at the bottom like an egg, but I like this look. Yeah, I th um, we actually, I think, uh, I don't know if you have that handy, Carrie, but there's a photo of a dome that went beyond the equator line. Um, this particular dome is supported at the equator and it kind of comes down below it. I don't know if you got that one handy, Carrie. Um, while she's looking for that, uh, as far as the possibility of harvesting water from the dome roof, you absolutely can. Um, however, like, like any other roof, I guess I would recommend uh, using the rainwater for, you know, landscape, not so much like your organic vegetable gardens, because especially, and here's the dome, um, it goes a little beyond the equator line, as you can see on the large dome on the right, it kind of uh, curves back in on itself. Um, but with the rainwater, a lot of times, especially if you have an asphalt roof, um, along with the rain, you'll bring some of the, you'll get some leach, chemical leaching from the shingles themselves. 
So the water that runs on any conventional home or dome roof or anything, depending on the roofing materials, will bring with it some leached chemicals uh, that will kind of get mixed into the water. So if you're watering trees and bushes, you know, no big deal. It's not going to really hurt anything. But if you're going to, you know, water your prized organic vegetable garden, you just may want to keep that in mind that you'll probably get some residual chemicals with that. So it kind of depends on what you're going to use the water. But as far as harvesting, it's the same as any other home. You just would have a gutter system around the perimeter of the dome that would capture the water and uh, you can direct it to your storage uh, receptacle, whether it's through underground tubing or however you're going to do it. Some people just have barrels at the bottom of their downspouts. Uh, depending on your riser wall height, that might be an option. Um, most riser walls will get you high enough to be able to put a, a barrel underneath it and capture it that way as well. So. Um, but yeah, so this is one of the domes we did, and, and Dennis, you could probably talk a little bit about this one, uh, but pretty unique, but it can be done. There's a lot of unique things you can do with domes, um, and actually, since you kind of helped with this one, Dennis, and this was before I was here, you might want to take over on that one for me a little bit. Sure. This uh, dome is up in Canada, and it, uh, it's unusual. It's a meditation uh, chamber, but it is supported on the equator of the dome, which is sort of in the middle there, you can see two rows of triangles going down below the middle equator line. And there's a floor inside, and there are brackets on the floor that support the bottom sections of the dome. Uh, the engineer could, if this was a, a concrete shell or a structural steel shell with uh, ribs all the way around, um, it probably could be supported by sitting on the bottom row of triangles, but they slope in. So you'd have to have rigid connections at each of those points. Can you do it um, like this? You could. Early on in the early 60s, there was a dome uh, up in the hills in uh, Hollywood, and that was a uh, pipe frame structure. And the interior floors were platforms independent of the dome. So what you're looking at here um, is something similar in the, in the reverse of that. When the dome is sitting on the floor and supported by the floor. There is a central mast foundation and there's a foundation that you see below that dome, but it's not supporting the outer shell. It's supporting a floor system which supports the dome. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carrie. And thanks for finding that photo as well. Um, all right, I think we're ready for the next question. And if you're there and you wanna jump in on your question, please do. We like to get some interaction from uh, everybody that was able to jump on with us tonight. And uh, it's a little easier talking to the people about their questions because sometimes we may not give you exactly what you're looking for for the information. So always feel free to jump in. So, all right, Carrie. Okay, so our next question is a follow-up from last week from Robert. Again, we're going to put Robert on the spot. What is the estimated date to do the Klamath Falls dome build? Um, did you have a chance to look into that, Dennis? Because I actually didn't have a chance. So on, on our website, we have dome raisings, which is um, a lot of our people and customers that build domes um, take advantage of a dome raising, which allows people that maybe have not had any building experience with domes to be able to come to the building site and, and help them raise the dome, which usually only takes one or two days. It goes up real quickly. And I'm assuming, and I, and I could be assuming wrong, that this is where the question came from, is that maybe somebody is planning on building in uh, Klamath Falls, and they're wondering what time they're going to have the dome raising. And we do update that page as we get feedback from the customer, but I guess I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if, if there was a date on there. Dennis, did you happen to see? No, I didn't get a chance to look at that, but I also want to say we're, we've been very lax in that because of the COVID situation. So right. our domes are uh, not open for the dome raising. Um, and, uh, that's, that's really probably the reason or postponed sometimes. Uh, there will be dome raisings going up this year uh, where, when they are available to be um, attended, either to watch or to help, that'll be noted on the page too. So when we get more into the summer, I would imagine we have uh, some open dome 
things. And if you're in the age bracket to get uh, the vaccine sooner than later, uh, we'll just have to see how this year pans out. Sure, sure, okay. All right, well, question number five comes from Harrison in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. I don't know that uh, Harrison is with us tonight, but if you are, send me a message in a chat or again, feel free to unmute yourself and fill in some blanks for us. Um, but Harrison asks, what do I look for when buying land to build a dome? What questions do I ask to make sure I can build on a dome on the land before I buy it? Want to grab that one, Dennis? Or <laughs> yeah. we, uh, there's really two situations where you would be restricted with a dome. One is if you've got a homeowners association and they have never seen a dome before, it's usually the case, um, because there's probably restrictions. They want you to build a certain style, uh, a certain size, a certain color. Uh, we usually call those developments either Beigeville or Grageville, one or the other. Uh, you want to live there, you've got to build their style. Or a developer owns the property and he is the builder or has a builder and they have you know, plan A, B, C, and D. And you pick one of those and you can change the color a little bit. So it's highly restricted. No domes, no earth homes, no log homes, nothing unusual, no pink doors, that kind of stuff. But we actually have a customer right now who does have a homeowners association and they have a dome in their homeowners area, in the association area. So he said, I don't have a problem with that. So that may be the case. And some of them might be open. I shouldn't close it off from the, that standpoint. Uh, the, the domes today are a lot different, a lot different than 40 years ago, even 20 years ago. But 40, 50 years ago, it's a whole different story. And, you know, show them the inside of the dome. We've done that several times to the neighbors uh, in different sites that we have open and they come in, they just can't believe what's inside the dome. So, uh, and it, we do them all over the place. So there's no restriction in the city. The dome uh, is able to be built anywhere. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, we've got domes in the city, more than one. And actually they're easier to deal with. Minneapolis just, we were in there and they go, well, what do you got? They got this, okay, side, side yard setbacks, uh, engineering certification, all the stuff they needed, bing, that was it. No problems with the building permit. So, yeah, I was going to say, we get a lot of domes going up in California, and I always figure that's kind of the standard. If you can get through California, then you can pretty much build almost anywhere, at least in, a, in the United States. So, um, okay, cool. All right, well, we're not doing bad on, we're actually getting through a few of these. We might get through them all tonight. So, I think we're ready for the next one, Carrie. And this one kind of, uh, speaking of California, I guess we can tie this in a little bit, so. Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. So uh, <laughs> this question is from Frank in Cathedral City, California, and Frank is with us tonight. So Frank, again, if uh, you need to chime in and clarify any information or wanna add anything. So we've got three questions. The first one is, are there any natural spaces, domes in, I, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, Idlewood, Idlewild, or Big Bear, California. Um, can these domes be built on sloped land on a platform with decking around it? How do I take advantage of views and natural light without sacrificing the dome's integrity, strength, and insulation from cold and heat? Well, I can answer the first part there. No, we don't have any domes in Big Bear. Um, we have several projects uh, around there actually this year in Joshua Tree in related areas. We do have some domes uh, further south than that. We do have a dome map. I, I didn't have a chance to look at it from that standpoint, but I sort of recall where the domes are. Uh, so we don't have one in Big Bear. I know there are some domes in Big Bear, uh, but not one of ours. Um, the uh, second question was, relate that back. Uh. You got it? I'll grab it. Uh, yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, can these domes be built on sloped land 
on a platform with decking around it. So uh, are you talking, Frank, about a platform and then putting a dome right on top of it? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, uh, that's, that's basically how a lot of the homes are built in Idlewild and the mountains because of the sloping. There's a lot of, there are not a lot of uh, sl slab foundations or basements, a lot of platforms. What you're dealing with is you've got to carry the corners of the dome down. That's where this, this whole structure comes down to that section. It's got to continue down to a footing of some sort and be connected to a foundation. From the platform standpoint, I've seen a couple of domes. There was one person that had a platform. She built a platform and then wanted our dome to sit on top. We had to go underneath and support those points. And had she built the platform to fit the dome, that's kind of what a floor joist system is, but it's the shape of the dome with the extensions. And that's what you need to have. You can have an extension going out, you need to have that anchor, you need to have that set up correctly to hold the dome down for high winds, whatever you're dealing with, earthquake zone, California. So that foundation has to be done right. Um, now that I'm seeing that, there's a perfect photo of the dome in Chile. I don't know if you can find that, Carrie, oh. but Chile, it's on a platform uh, on a hillside, very steep hillside. The dome in Sedona, they blasted out the hillside for about 20 feet, big chunk to get a slab on grade. And the other 20 feet of it's 25 feet of it's a 46 foot dome, sticks out, and there's pirates. So here you see there's the dome with extensions, and the extensions have supports at the corners and it goes down into the ground and you can see the bracing on that platform. This dome went through a chilly earthquake and it was 7.2 or something in that range. Maybe it says on the, on the, on the description of it. But it's a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. You see all the skylights, nothing broke. It took the load, it took that shake that you get, the, the trembling, the movement of the earth. So you design for that. You design and, and cross brace the, uh, the footings and stuff. It's a small dome, it's 20, uh, 26 foot diameter dome, but nothing was damaged in the dome. This, is, this is, could be a before or after photo on this. So you just need to carry that foundation and be concerned with what kind of foundation you have. There's the Sedona Dome. It's got concrete. Gary, you're getting pretty good at this website. <laughs> an expert. Stick this thing up, and uh, they're tied together. You can see the beam underneath the deck, and there's a deck going all the way around it, primarily to wash the windows. Beautiful view, fantastic view of a huge uh, cliff on a mountain across the valley. So that's why this big grouping, there's a big grouping of 19 triangle skylights there. So it's dealing with that all the time on slope sites if you don't want a basement or it's not conducive to a basement or a walkout down below. And there's a lot of extra money involved in that, but uh, you can adapt the dome to any terrain, any terrain at all. Right. Last part of that, you wanna grab that last part there? Uh, sure. The last part was just uh, regarding the skylights, essentially. Uh, how do you take advantage of the views with natural light without sacrificing in the integrity, strength, and insulation? Um, there's no compromise whatsoever on the dome's uh, strength or integrity. As far as that's concerned, you could put a skylight in every single triangle and the dome will be as strong as if it was completely covered in plywood. So there's no concern with that. As far as uh, you know, how you're going to deal with insulation, there's definitely going to be a loss wherever you're going to have a, you know, a window versus a wall. Um, especially if you go with our recommendations on domes, which are usually very highly insulated around R50, R60 in the wall cavity, where most of your skylights and windows are going to probably be between R3 and 4. So you will lose 
um, some R value. However, if you're uh, if you place them properly, a lot of times, you know, for instance, if you're in a hot area and they're faced kind of south or west, which you try to avoid, but there's tinting available. Uh, there's things you can do to try to minimize the negative impacts, but yeah, it's not going to be as, as good as as like the regular wall or, or roof, roof structure would be, just like any other home as well. It's always going to be kind of a, uh, a weak spot regarding uh, heating and cooling is concerned as far as your insulation value. So, Are they double pane? Yeah. Yep. I'll bring that up. They're, they're double pane, low E and argon gas. Okay. Current kind of basic technology. Uh, there are some skylights coming out and our glass is made for us. We make this triangle skylights. We actually manufacture those skylights, but the glass is made for us by Old Castle Glass. We're dealing, they're dealing with uh, LOF, PPG, all the major manufacturers. If you wanted uh, solar band 80 uh, and block out a certain spectrum of light, that can be had. Uh, we do laminated safety glass. All of our glass is tempered glass. So it's three sixteenths or quarter inch tempered glass. That's a big deal with us. Um, <clears throat> sample right here. So we're dealing with a wood frame that's got flashing on the outside and there's like 30 colors to choose from on the flashing to match your shingles. We integrate our skylights with the ice and water shield below it. And then on the upside, you're going to have a piece coming over on it for waterproofing. But the technology in the glass at the moment, there is some stuff, is some glass out there that have uh, gel in glass, multi layers. We do offer triple pane. I do have four pane glass over in the uh, original dome that I had on the property here from 1975. Um, it's four panes with three quarter inch air spaces. So the glass is quite thick. The, the unit is quite thick. And that's in the bathroom over there at, uh, at the forest dome, we call it, which happens to be the virtual dome that Derek is in. Um, so- That's why it's always sunny in my dome. Yeah, right. <laughs> Green leaves are great in the wintertime out there, right? Yeah. 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 So we, can, we can make custom skylights. We've done it to uh, whatever the technology is, whatever the kind of glass. And believe me, there's a lot of glass color and tint and types of coatings that you can on glass. You want bulletproof glass? We can do that. So whatever you need. Has it Thank you. Quick as a quick follow-up, um, this is from Frank, but also I think it's a great question for the group. If there are domes in your area or nearby that we know about, so for example, in Joshua Tree, um, is it possible to drive by those domes and see them? Or do we contact uh, the owners to say, hey, would you be willing to show you? Do we do any kind of facilitation for that? Yes, we do. Uh, most of our customers, I'm going to say 95% of our customers don't have an issue. Um, we usually give you their name and phone number, unless it's a cell phone number. Um, what we get permission from the owner when we're dealing with them initially and say, okay, do you mind if we give your name and, and not your address, but your name and a phone number or contact, email contact, so somebody can contact you and it's invariably we're dealing with a huge group of people that say yes. They like to talk about it. They like to show it off. They like to tell you how it's built, what they did with it. So it's, uh, it's that kind of a, a dome owner. So uh, we do that and with COVID going on. I know there was one customer recently, um, they did allow that person to come up to it, look at it, look around it. We don't just, usually give you an ad, we don't give you an address, not usually, we don't give you an address. Um, but when you do, it's usually tucked away. You know, it's not, there's a few of them that are out there wide open. Uh, and the ones in Minneapolis, St. Paul, there's city lots. But the one in Minneapolis, you can drive by it in the nighttime if the light's not on, it's a three stall garage that faces the street and you'd miss it. 
In fact, there are people that live down in South Minneapolis, they don't know it's there. So I guess that answers that. <laughs> yeah, I'll just throw in real quick, Dennis. That's, that's a good point because the, a customer that's in Colorado Springs, I found a bunch of our domes within 20 minutes of them. And when I looked on Google uh, Earth, I, I realized just driving by, you can't see them. You know, a lot of people, I think that's one of the things with uh, a lot of people like to build domes in really neat locations. And, and one feature the dome has are these large groupings of skylights that allow you to take advantage of these great views. So oftentimes domes are some of them are right in the middle of the city, but they're still maybe on a creek or something where they're kind of tucked back in and they kind of are private with some trees and stuff. So, yeah, it's not always as easy as just driving by. In fact, I had a hard time trying to find one for them to go kind of check out because they were all pretty much hidden. They would actually go in the driveway to, to see anything. So, I'll add one more thing to that. In that uh, we do have a private Google map with our domes on there. Uh, there's 2,000 domes. Not all of those domes are ours. When we hear about a dome, when we get an address, when we get a contact with somebody uh, or a dome sold, we put it on our list. And that list then is on a Google map. But it's private. We're not going to give it out. Uh, it's not going to be made available because we consider this private information that uh, the people just don't want to have that sitting out there. So, but we can find a dome. In your area, usually there's, it's, they're all over. They're all over, believe me, 2,000 domes. And maybe, uh, I don't know, there might be 25 to 35 domes that are in other countries. And the rest are in the U.S., U.S. and Canada. Right. Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Western Wisconsin, uh, there's somewhere in the range of 350 to 400 domes in this east central Minnesota and western, west central Wisconsin. Okay. All right. Thank you both. So the next question is from Jim in Klamath Falls. That might solve our Klamath Falls question, uh, Mr. Yeah. And Jim is with us. And so he is uh, wondering, have you helped build communal domes? For example, one big meeting hall dome encircled by single family domes, maybe with an atrium in the middle? We've done um, quite a few um, groups of domes. And I guess that's our, that's our nickname for them. These are groupies. We've got a central dome and a bunch of domes around them. Um, there are some plans that we have for double, triple, uh, four, four domes uh, on our website plan page. I believe there are some. And We've got quite a few that we've done. There's some plans that we've drawn that didn't get materialized. Joining the domes together, you need a larger central dome in order to have a connecting link going through the dome, whether it's second floor or main floor. Um, so you can't take a 29 foot dome and put six domes around it. There's no way to join that those six domes into that one 29 footer if you had a 45 foot dome or a 50 foot dome, you'd have a chance to make those connections. So it's planning that out uh, with the size of dome that you're gonna have with a communal dome. We've got a couple of resort things that we planned that didn't materialize, but we did that in those situations. So um, it's all what you have in your imagination. It's not a problem connecting domes, our complex over here, that's our office, my old house, um, the guest house, the screen porch, the garage, it's all connected. And the house was 1975, the office dome was, that had a different dome connected on. So we took that one down, put up the office dome in 90, added another dome in 95 out of the screen porch in 2005. So you can keep adding domes on, not an issue. Okay. okay, sorry, I was doing some chat work, so a little delay there. i uh, give you a chance to take a, a breath. All right, so question number eight comes from David, and David is with you, uh, with us, with 
all of us <laughs> collectively tonight. And uh, he's coming from Ocean Shores, Washington. And his question um, has to do, please speak to the practicality of a dome floor plan with one bedroom, two bath as a starter home. Later, adding on a modular bedroom, perhaps even two bedrooms, like a rectangular mobile home sort of box structure attached to an extension on the dome. Is this practical from a cost point of view? This would allow a lower cost building that could be upgraded later. Imagine the average county would not know what to do with a mixed zoning, both stick built and modular on the same lot. Also, the lot would need to be accessible to a 10 by 20 or 12 by 24 trailer after the home has been constructed. Modular bedrooms would be a new concept for the factory builders for which a market would need to develop. Funny you should ask the question. Um, there's an ongoing project right now, about an hour from where we are in uh, Cumberland, Wisconsin. It's an older dome from the 80s and they wanted, this was a vacation dome and they wanted to move there. They're retiring and they're going to move there. Um, they added um, containers. So they started with two 12 by 40 foot containers. They then added two more 12 by 20 foot containers, one each on top of the other. So we've got a picture here, a bunch of pictures that we can show you of this project to show you that. And, and your question, you know, that what are the counties going to, the city or county is going to say about that or different types of building products? Doesn't matter. They're handled differently. The dome sits on a pure foundation, the um, structures being added on, and they are built. They are there. Uh, we don't have, it hasn't been shingled yet. It's being under construction now in the wintertime. So you can see there the container, and you had to have enough room to get the containers in there and have a crane come in and lift them over. So here's, this picture shows you a good shot of the dome. The lake that it's on is of course down the hill from where this uh, platform is. So here again are some pier footings being done. This is an architect's rendering. I did the design on this, but there is a, uh, a firm that did the uh, enhancement, if you want to call it that. So uh, it's, a, it's a real nice setting. This is exactly what they have. The container on the left is a 40 foot container with a 20 foot container on the, on the top of it. That's the master bedroom, large glass area to face the lake. The container on the right is a guest bedroom. You can see it through the trees there. Again, some large windows facing the lake. Uh, upstairs of the master bedroom, there is an exercise room and the other one has some more facilities, craft room and things. And there are decks on top of those containers. And you can see the decks out all around, go all the way around the dome. So this, this dome is being taken down to its skin and being totally redone um, and has been redone. And then like I said, the containers are there. It's unique. And this is what uh, the, the first pictures you saw were an early scheme. And this is a later scheme where they said, okay, let's look at this color scheme. So they did black um, horizontal steel on it along with vertical Corten steel on the other parts of it. There are protrusions from the 12 foot wide containers to get a 16 or 18 foot wide or 20 foot wide space inside. So they're not just straight uh, long boxes. They're, they're going to bump outs on them. It's kind of a fun design to do. Um, I haven't been back to the site. I was over there when, the, when we were laying out to see if this could fit on the site and it could. There's some setbacks from the lake, which is why the containers are in the back, plus the dome has got uh, uh, windows all the way around. You know, switch back to that other shot, Jerry. The lower part of the dome is straight vertical walls. So it kind of ties into the rest of the structure, but there's a whole band of, of new windows, 
but the original dome had windows in there. They just replaced the windows and upgraded them from the 1980 style. And then the triangle skylights up on top, um, those are gonna be the new ones they put in. There were a few that were in there originally from 1980. So that's been changed to take advantage of the view. And there is an upstairs uh, loft area for sleeping area. But let's see, there's, I think this is now a three bed, could we consider it a three bedroom house? So. Okay. Okay. Uh, David just had a follow up comment that he was thinking of an expandable starter dome. Also, Here's this expandable 33 foot diameter starter dome. So it's got 800 square feet in the dome. And uh, we quadrupled or more than that space by adding containers and adding a container on top of a container. So plan it out, do the master plan, and uh, you can do it. Whether it's modular, container, uh, you've got to have the room to bring that structure in. So whatever size dome you want to start out with, plan that dome out to take an extending link. In this case, there's a two-story connecting link. This is a low-profile 33-foot dome on top of an eight-foot or really nine-foot high wall. So you, can, you can make that decision in the beginning that you're going to add on and then a plan for it and the plan you know, works out. So you get openings where you want them. Okay. Actually, Dennis, I'll grab the next kind of uh, group of questions here because we got some similar questions. This way we can try to get through a few more of them. Um, so this one, I'll just kind of do a quick, and if you guys are on there, I, I got five of them that I'm gonna group together. So feel free to jump in. Um, but I got Jessica. And she was wondering about uh, price differences from a 40 foot high to a 44 mid. And then I have uh, Richard who is also uh, from Norwalk, Ohio, which is uh, ironic because that's actually where I grew up when I was a real little kid in Norwalk. Um, looking to discuss uh, on the truck and out the door road pricing. Um, so, Again, kind of going to the pricing. And then we have uh, Theodore, who was also wondering about cost planning design. Um, common questions, you know, people wonder what things are going to cost. Uh, Lewis also is uh, uh, currently in a dome, approximately 1,800 square feet, wants to build the same size as a rental on a piece of property. What's the current cost for square foot, labor, et cetera? And then our last one, I'm gonna kind of group in here because uh, it's cost related is Brenda. Um, and she kind of uh, hit the whole gamut with land costs, utilities, construction costs, overall costs of build, maintenance, durability and climate and lifespan. So we can kind of just, I'll start with the first one, Dennis. We'll kind of just kind of jump in there, I think would be the best way because this, these are kind of, uh, there's a lot of variables with these particular uh, questions and options. Um, but to try to get through all of them quickly, I'll uh, start with Jessica and just say that the big difference between like a 40 foot high profile and a 44 foot mid profile, um, if you're looking at it from in respect to um, buying our dome kits, it jumps up a price because the frequency kind of jumps from a three frequency to a four frequency between the 40 foot and the 44 foot. Uh, and so the difference is 105 panels versus uh, triangles versus 160 triangles. So there's just more hardware, more components. Um, it would cost more to have built because it's also a little larger square footage. But as far as the kits are concerned, it kind of has a big jump up, even though it doesn't really get that much larger just because it, it provides a lot more components. Um, and then Dennis, we want to maybe grab the next one. Um, why don't we just jump to... The 1800 square foot dome, basically looking at building a second one and just wondering about the, the current cost per square foot for labor. And I know I think a couple of these we could probably just direct to, we kind of have a cost calculator online is probably the easiest way to do it. I mean, we were talking earlier about that. It's like buying a Ford truck, you know, you could buy a Ford F-150 and, and the price range can really be significant even for the same kind of a truck, just depending on all the options you want. Uh, you know, are you going to go with high-end finishings versus standard versus low-end? 
Um, where are you building California versus Nebraska versus Hawaii? You know, there's a lot of things that dictate that, but we do have a cost calculator online where you can put in square footage and, and it spits out a lot of numbers. Are you gonna be doing a lot of the work or hiring out the work? Um, what quality level are you looking at? So we try to direct people there to kind of get started as, you know, just kind of get a ballpark number of what they're looking to do. Um, do you want to elaborate on that at all, Dennis, or? No, I think that's the big deal is that this cost calculator will really give you a range to add up your square footage. Uh, you need to account for all of the square footage. People go, well, that's just a loft. Or put the basement underneath, they don't cost very much. Sort of tell you the basements cost as much as above ground space. Because today, it's got to be done correctly. It's part of the living environment. So add all of that square footage. There's a cost range. So if you had stuff that was unfinished, say to the lower end of that range, if you wanted high-end stuff, you've got to go to a different level, which is A, B, and C. You know, in, in the kitchen, you can have a 30-inch stove, and it's uh, 500 bucks. Or you find one that's used for scratch and dent. But you can also put in the six burner gas wolf, you know, $20,000 in a stove, easy. So it's those components that are going to throw you for a loop when you go to price these things out. But the dome components are there. You go to our section called the dome store. And uh, I think Carrie's going to put something online on the chat uh, page. And it shows you dome cost calculation guide along with other individual components are listed there so you can compare sizes and prices. Right, right. And one thing I will touch on uh, from Brenda, she was, part of her question besides cost was also um, uh, maintenance, durability with climate and lifespan of dome. And that, and that kind of works on a similar level as far as, you know, your quality of materials that you're using. I mean, there's roofing options that should last, you know, possibly a hundred years or more. There's roofing options that will last 50 years. Uh, there's obviously big price differences between the two. So it kind of, that kind of goes along with the cost. I mean, the more you spend, usually if you're getting your value, the more you spend, you're going to get better, longer lasting materials with lower maintenance. Um, and that will obviously increase the lifespan of the dome or at least the lifespan of the materials. So um okay i think we got through those five anyway uh and i think uh you know one was cost of planning that's also uh, at the dome store will kind of give you a rough idea but that also varies on the complexity of the dome you need to be uh you need to have designed um you know a simple dome versus a multi-dome complex or something is obviously going to be big differences there too so um so sorry i couldn't really give you guys like exact numbers on on those questions but you know, hopefully you can. This is Brenda. Oh, hi, Brenda. Hi. Um, well, I, I don't. I don't expect um, the exact amount because you know, obviously, it depends on location and everything. It's just that right, we wanted right. to know um, the starting off point, but also, um, uh, I mean, I've heard. I've always wanted a dope home, and I heard about their durability. I um, lived in California for 20 years, but now I'm back in my home state of, of um, Boston. So I'm, okay. I'm looking, um, so I'm seriously looking, but I, I need to think about where am I gonna place this home and, um, and what's the durability of it? And how do I find out about the durability? And, um, and uh, uh, what are the things that I need to think about when building this and, um, and uh, if I'm going to be building this, will I be able to find people to help me build it? Things like that. Um, uh, uh, all those things, building from scraps, um, you know, from the beginning uh, is sure. all new to me. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We're dealing with uh, a lot of variables. You can choose the uh, aluminum shakes they're 320 bucks a square. Uh, they're gonna last forever. They're not gonna wear out. Um, you can buy the asphalt shingles, the high grade asphalt shingles that we recommend, Malarkey Legacy brand. 
and those are $145 per square. So it's half the cost, less than half the cost. Mm. Uh, that's all of it. And those are 50 year shingles. And I've got 35 year shingles that I put on the original dome in 1983. So they're now 38 years old mm. and they're 35 year rated 35 year shingle. They're still fine. They're not curled up. There's nothing wrong with them. They're probably good for another 10 years, partly because you have a ventilated dome shell. Well, that's going to keep the surface or below surface temperature of that um, cooler and allow it to breathe. So constructed correctly is part of what you have to talk about when you're talking about durability, longevity. Uh, you've got to use the right components. You've got to use the right kind of roofing materials. And yes, you have to know what you're doing, but you're going to find a builder. You're going to find a contractor who can do that. We don't have set people that are going to go around, but we're going to offer our assistance in working with the builder. We have a set of plans and a set of materials that we know work and the climate zones, are, there's seven climate zones in the US. So we're designing differently for those seven different climates. So all of that relates to it. The inside material, what we've got here is spruce, not sheetrock. Um, that's an issue in a climate zone that goes from you know plus 95 to minus 30, minus 40 where we are. Um, if you put sheetrock in here, you're going to have cracks along the joints. You've got to put batten strips over those. So this material, the spruce that we have, uh, is a very durable wood. This is 15 years old. The other dome has the remodeling done in 1983. That material, we didn't haven't done anything to it. There's no chemicals on this either. This is plain, ordinary wood. So it's a hard one to answer and give you a concrete answer. But other than to say, don't worry about it. It's really, uh, I, I'll, I'll finish by saying this. Take your budget, go to that cost calculating guide and do a reverse mathematics on it. Put in a square footage and see what that cost comes out. If it's too high, bring your square footage down and then see what the costs say it's supposed to be. And if you want a very durable building and you want to put a lot of stuff into it, go down to the highest level, which is the C level. That means there's a bigger kitchen, more bathrooms. But if you're into it from a smaller house, stay in the B level or go to the economy level. But in the economy level, you got to watch all your costs. So it's a trade-off. But yeah. the, the dome itself, our dome, is going to last forever. I'm going to say it that way. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think uh, if you were to compare it to like a conventional home, there's no advantage to a conventional home over a dome as far as longevity is concerned. Um, if they're both built right with today's building science um, and good materials, they should last a very, very long time. Uh, as far as the builder thing, um, some builders get excited to do something different and some builders just don't like the idea of doing something different. It kind of depends on what type of builder uh, you happen to come across some builders uh, want to stay doing the same thing and kind of stamp them out and they get their system down for maximum profit and some builders really enjoy uh, like when I was young and I was involved more in uh, carpentry and stuff the company I was working for they love to do unique projects um, in fact ironically enough they always wanted to build a dome and we never had a dome project to build so I think if you're able to find a builder that you know, might be excited about it. Um, that's really the way to do it. Um, it probably is a little more difficult to find a good builder for a dome than it is a conventional home, just because you kind of eliminate those uh, cookie cutter builders out of the mix. But other words, I mean, we sell domes all the time and they get good builders and they do a good job. And, um, and if that's the case, it should last as long as a well-built conventional home. Um, and like Dennis said, there's no reason it shouldn't last forever, really. I mean, if it's taken well care of and and built properly. That's the main thing, building it properly. So Yeah, I agree, building it properly, because I have looked at some homes that have already been built and people are selling them. And some of them look, and you know, that 
some of them who, who claim they built it themselves, uh, I would never even consider just um, uh, making an offer because they look so awful. You know, so I mean, what I'm looking at at your homes, they're really nice. But I do want to make sure that I'm, you know, um, knowing what I do doing because I don't want my home to look awful. <laughs> right, right. And 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 that's that's kind of uh, it. Didn't do it. Didn't do the dome industry any favors. The fact that a lot of domes were available as kits, and so you did have a lot of customers doing their very first construction project was their dome home that they bought as a kit. And you're right. In a lot of cases, they didn't necessarily build those properly. It shouldn't be a reflection on domes. However, it kind of is, but really if you build them properly, they're, they're going to perform and last as long as any other structure, you know, so. We're going to go on to another question, but just to end this one, I want to say that my background when I got into domes in 1970 was working for an architect for 10 years. So my background is architecture. I came into it from a whole different basis. Yeah, my hair was long, curled on my shoulders, and you could say I was a hippie, but I knew what I was doing. I knew uh, structure, I knew building components, and uh, I did a lot of changes, and we did domes in the 70s that we said, okay, this isn't working because of various, the building science wasn't there. Oh, in the in late 70s, early 80s, we changed the whole system, learning from the several hundred domes that we have built in the 70s. So, yeah. And we, well, continue, like we continue to change products. We continue to add more value to the house and longevity. For that Thanks. Yeah, that's one unique thing Dennis brings to the table is 50 years of uh, experience, so <laughs> which, is, which is very good. Uh, speaking of which, it is seven. We do have a few more questions uh, that we haven't gotten to yet, so we can save them for next time. Or did you want to try to get through a few more, Dennis? A few more. Okay. So quick follow-up question. We've had a lot of questions in the chat about contractors. Um, do we help vet the contractor? Yeah. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna know talking to them if they're interested in building the dome. It's when they come at you and say, why are you building this crazy design? It's gonna be complicated. When in fact, we tell them, hey, you're gonna put up this uh, 49 foot diameter dome here and the frame and the outside panels are gonna go on in four days. I go, no. So if they're enthralled with that, if they're into, building something different and have built something different. And you want references. You want references from people and you want to ask the question, when the problems came up, how did they solve it? How did they work it out? Every project, conventional houses, commercial projects, whatever, their problems, whatever they may be. But the builder should be the one to analyze it, grasp it, work it out with you. How do you change it? How do you alter it? When you add the uh, jacuzzi hot tub and uh, or the big eight person hot tub on the deck and it's not designed for that weight to go on that deck. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to change, but um, it, it shouldn't be the contractor that's going to dictate things. You're going to have an idea, you're going to have a plan and he's going to build that and he's going to talk to us. And the ones that don't talk to us, boy, um, we, we've gone back. What? They, that's the other thing. Uh, Tessa said, that we have dome school. When we have dome school, we're gonna have a virtual dome school again here. And I think Derek is gonna put it, we're gonna put it into May. And then a real dome school, if we can get to it in uh, August, uh, maybe it'll be later and switch it to September or October. If we have to from the COVID situation, but we have a lot of contractors attend dome school. So the virtual dome school is going to help your contractor and they ask questions. They know what we're talking about. They get involved. They're usually the ones that are building a dome are more excited than you sometimes. 
the construction manual that we have, I'm getting prompted by the by Tessa over here. This is our construction manual. And basically it's uh, a lot of pages We're dealing with a lot of instructions in here. This is 400 pages or more I've been told now. We also have a supplement to that. So when you do have a builder, uh, these are some how to's for various things uh, dealing with, I'll call it conventional construction, how to build things correctly. We're gonna send them to buildingscience.com uh, because that site is the Bible. The person that owns and runs buildingscience.com is the one that is changing and altering the international residential code, which is the one code that's in existence in the US. So we have one code, it's that thick, this is it for everybody. And there are supplements to this in various, like Minnesota's got a supplement. So okay. uh, I think we answered that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm pulled in chat chat and, and questions. So uh, Brian Trippy is asked if, from Rock Island, Tennessee. And Brian, I think is still on. Yep, they're still on. And his question is, I saw a customer of yours use helical piers instead of a concrete foundation, but had some troubles later on. Since this was a year or two ago, have any improvements been made or lessons learned to make he helical piers a viable alternative to a concrete foundation? Would you recommend them? Yes, uh, the dome can be built with any kind of bottom structure foundation. And in certain soils, the helical pills, helical piers are going to work. They're basically got a screw anchor on them and you just drill them into the ground. Um, they can go down to front, you know, through a peat bog and hit a solid surface that might be 18, 25 feet below. Um, you may be wanting to raise the dome up above a floodplain. You're in a floodplain land. So all of that can be taken care of. Uh, we've got a dome uh, on our website under the blog section on the right hand side of the page. I think it's the right hand side, yeah. Uh, it's Doug Peterson's dome down in Iowa. So you can go on our website, the home page, scroll down to that and take a look. He's got his complete building records going way back. They finally moved in, uh, they built them totally themselves. So you have a good idea on that one with the peers, what they did. The problems they had was that the peer company didn't provide engineering. And the building inspector came along and said, okay, show me the engineering on this. Well, the problem was you got the peer sticking up and they weren't adjusted. They weren't braced for a side to side racking strength. So he had to add braces in there on each of the piers connected to the rim joist and foundation of a floor foundation. And that was all he had to do. But if you do want to go that way, make sure that the company that's supplying the piers has an engineer or we can, you can use our engineer. It's a cost of course to have any engineering done but they can be engineered and then that'll tell you what you have to brace. But we've done a lot of domes that are done on piers or point loads, knowing how to brace it in earthquake zones, D and E in California, which are the worst earthquake zones. So, and they've gone through earthquakes very successfully. Or the beach dome in North Carolina, it's still there. You can rent the beach dome, see what it's like. You know, Dennis, that it reminds me, do you happen to have that sample of the super wall in there uh, handy? Because this is actually Brian, who last uh, week, I believe it was, asked about the zip panels, and I was going to look into it for you. And since you're on here, I'll just uh, tell you now what I found out. Um, so the zip panels, so our triangles are, uh, we have no internal framing inside the triangles, which is nice for insulation because you just can put in a big, uh, a triangle worth of insulation without all the thermal 
uh, bridging going on. Um, zip panels are kind of designed to have that insulation to break a lot of those, uh, the thermal bridging from your studs in a wall, for instance. Um, the problem is, and I, and I looked to see if they had three quarter inch panels, which is what you need to span the distance we do on the triangles, because you need to have a 32 inch span. Um, but it looks like five eighths is as high as they go. So I don't think zip would work for our, for our purposes for an exterior sheeting, but, uh, and, and Dennis, I don't know if you could also have that back up again, I'm sorry. Um, but as you can see on our struts, uh, on the super wall struts, if Dennis gets that back up there, you'll see there's, we kind of have insulation in between there as a thermal break. So the upper strut is what actually supports the wind and snow loads of the dome that gusset plate that comes down holds an inner strut, which can be variable. So you can have whatever thickness you want of your dome. And that's what holds the interior panels in place. And then that cavity would be filled with insulation, but that's where we get our thermal break. Um, so anyway, I just figured I'd follow up with you on that since you actually asked about last week, so. There's no bracing that we need inside that triangle. We don't need studs at 16 inches on center. We're dealing with three quarter inch tongue and groove paneling boards. They span easily across that triangle and support the load. What's the load? The insulation. That's all they're holding. So the outside is three quarter inch plywood. It's um, more than the cheap plywood. It's an underlayment grade. So it's got exterior glues. Um, so with that, you don't need any studs in here to interfere. This is insulated. Ours is ventilated. A lot of places we don't ventilate. We use foam, we use fiberglass, high density fiberglass. It's a industrial grade fiberglass with no phenolic resins, no uh, formaldehyde. So there's a lot of variables that we do to provide something that is really economical to build from the material standpoint. 60% less building materials in our dome structure compared to a conventional house. Um, I, one of these times I'm gonna have a picture of this conventional house that's got all this lumber, just incredible amount of lumber in it and show you the pile that we need to create something that's gonna take a 100 pound snow load minimum and 150 mile an hour wind speed rating minimum compared to the conventional house which usually is not done to that standard. All right, perfect, I appreciate uh, answering both questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Brian. All right, Gary. All right, so we're down to three uh, because I actually answered one of the questions that we had in the chat, so <laughs> we're ahead. Um, all right, so uh, this question is from Brad uh, Bradley from Medford, Minnesota. I think we know where that is. And is it possible to use a treated wood floor on a 29 foot dome? Years ago, I bought a 29 foot that was designed to be a garage or house from someone, uh, from you, someone ordered but never built. I'm just getting around to it and I had just have the walls and a set of paper drawings you made. The answer I'm gonna say, and again, it's, it's like, okay, I've been doing this long enough to say this. No, it's, it's possible, but you don't want to do it. You're not going to have the structural rigidity in that wood floor. And this is treated wood floor lumber that's used across um, the bottom with insulation, some insulation below it. You're much, much better off and cheaper and better built by using a concrete slab. The wall comes down, sits on a footing plate, and that concrete slab goes up against it to stop the push from the outside when you backfill the basement. So wood floor has got to be, you got a circle. You've got pressure from all three sides. You're going to have cross grain in the sense you're going to put studs in the floor to hold that flooring you're putting down. You have to stop the ground moisture from coming up. You need insulation below the slab, below the floor. There's just too many things you have to deal with than a wood, treated wood floor joist system. Two by fours or two by sixes is what they do. Just, we tried it. I guess that's what I want to say. We did that in the early seventies. 
we abandon it. We just said, forget it. That doesn't work. The cost, the time, getting to seal that floor to stop the ground moisture from coming up, the ground radon from coming up, the bugs from coming up. You're much better off with a concrete slab insulated below with four inches of foam or more. The permanent wood works great for the foundation walls, but not so much the the floor portion of that. Yeah, foundation yes, floor no. <laughs> I guess is the easiest way. All right. So Jim from Franklin, Maine, um, it has a question. Um, he has an estimate to replace his roof. The roofer has no experience with domes, but appears to be a highly regarded roofer. They want to replace the skylights too, and he is wondering if this is necessary or can the skylights just be resealed? Um, you, need, you need chapter 16, uh, which is in our manual. We have it available for all the roofers that don't have an experience with domes. Um, it's, you can download it, it's $30 charge. You can download this and then print out copies for the builder and for you. Uh, you can call us and, and ask us questions on it. But it shows you asphalt roofing. Uh, Ranky shapes are very similar, but it shows you asphalt roofing on a dome. When you want to re-roof a dome, I, I should, you, need to, you need to probably send us an email that's more, a little more detailed. Uh, how much uh, did it cost? How much was the bid? Is it a reasonable bid? How many squares for that price? What's the quality of the shingle? Those are all the questions that kind of relate to, to this. Uh, he may never have roofed a dome before, but there are some questions about don't go over the shingles that you currently have. You want to strip that down to the roof deck. And then the question is, is the roof deck plywood or is it OSB board? wafer board. And there's a real huge difference. Any damage that you see, you need to replace that. And that's a matter mm -hmm. of what kind of dome system that you have um, from the standpoint of early domes being built and there are different standards that we use in the materials. Darryl, okay. Darryl, you have that, Darryl? Yeah, no, I, I think that sums it up. I mean, essentially any good roofer should have no problem roofing a dome. There's no secrets to it. It's not anything complicated. It's just, sure, there's a trick or two to the trade. Um, but like Dennis said, if he has that chapter 16, it, he can just thumb through it in a few minutes and pretty much know what he needs to do to do the job correctly. It's not, uh, it's not real difficult. But at the same time, you do want it done correctly because when it comes to a dome, uh, the majority of your exterior is roof. Um, there's not a lot of siding costs, so uh, you want to make sure it's done right so you don't have to worry. And nowadays, if you use even good asphalt shingles, if you do it right, it should be good for 50 years. So it's it's worth making sure <laughs> it doesn't get done right. You still do see people do them wrong every once in a while, unfortunately, but it's it's not real hard. So do not use ridge caps. Ridge caps go over the ridge of a house, but they don't go over the joint where you've got a break in the surface. The dome has all of these. Uh, we've been expert witness witnesses on uh, insurance claims from a roofer that did ridge caps on every single line and realized that if the ridge cap's going at an angle, the water's gonna go right behind it. There's nothing to stop it. But that roofer will come back after it leaks in your house and say, well, gee, I'll fix it. Don't sue me. Don't, don't do anything. I'll fix it. And comes back with silicone and seals all the upper edge of the ridges, the ridge cap shingles. Well, silicone, first of all, is not compatible with asphalt. So in a short time, it might be six months, might be a year, that's going to start to crack, separate, and you'll have leaks. And you won't find them because it travels down to something else and comes out inside the house somewhere. So yeah, there's a way to do this correctly. We've been doing it long enough and it should be something that you are uh, looking at to get our expertise. And we're saying, first thing you need, you need this 
instruction manual. If you're doing a different kind of roofing, elastomeric, uh, ranky shakes, that's what you want. If you only do metal roof, ranky shakes are a bit the only way you can do the dome. We've had people try with standing seam roofs, it doesn't work. It does work only on a two frequency dome. There's one picture I have of our uh, uh, dealer of ours back in the 80s and they did a 29 foot diameter dome with standing seam. And it, the triangle pattern is such that it works. Anything else? There, you know, three, four, or five frequency domes, you can't do it. Right. This is a good segue into our last question of the night about roofing. And it comes from John in Sedona. So it's a multi-part question. One is, uh, can, we can he hire us to come roof the dome? Um, and he understands that we have pre-cut shingles. Is this new since their dome was built or were pre-cut shingles put on this dome? And then um, also, can they get the name of the company who has replacement window hardware? Sure. Well, if it's replacement window hardware, um, I'd have to look at that. We do with Marvin Windows, and uh, you, you know, you're you're dealing with um, a lot of different kinds and brands of, of windows. If the skylights, the same thing. They're different brands, but generally. Hardware is available. Um, if it's a skylight, that's a different story. It's not really, if it's operable, it's, that's long gone. Um, from the standpoint, will we do your roof? We really don't do roofs, natural spaces. Dan Newcomb, uh, who is our go-to roofer around here, will travel. So maybe if that was Sedona in the spring or something or early spring when he's not, when he can't do a roof here, uh, you might have a chance to get him down. There. It's at least maybe reasonable or maybe in the late fall, early winter, you know, so Hawaii would not be a problem in the winter if that was scheduled for January or February. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, I can't believe we got through all those. That seemed like a lot when we got started, but um, did anybody have anything that if we answered your question that we might've missed that you want to ask before we sign off or did we uh, manage to get through it all? Well, I think I, I think I tackled everything in the chat, so I don't think we have anything there. I have a follow-up uh, for one thing. That's not a question. And then um I think we're we're good. 20 minutes over isn't too bad for us. So thank you everyone who stayed <laughs> with us. There were great questions tonight and really great conversation in the chat. I really enjoyed talking to all of you that, that chimed in. That was really fun. The next session is two weeks from now. We're moving this to a uh, bi-weekly uh, occurrence just from a variety of, uh, of issues that we have, but um, you can send your questions in and we will be answering them. Uh, what's that date, February the 10th? Am I right? Uh, let me confirm that. Yes, here. I believe yep. so. Yep, yeah. two weeks from now is a test. And then we'll have another one two weeks later than that. So it'd be February the 24th. And then the two weeks after that, we're considering changing the time and maybe the day uh, to a morning time to allow um, European people or in a different time zone entirely to, uh, to get onto this. So once every couple of months, we'll probably do that. So just watch our website. Thanks for uh, coming along and joining with us. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, we get to answer a lot of questions in a short period of time. And this saves a lot of time from our standpoint relating to sending emails or have long phone conversations. So thank you for joining us. All right, everybody. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.